We are happy to have you back on our search for the human humane here in architecture in our tropical exotic coast metropolis of Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, today it's going to be the three kids from the block. It's actually the uh, Harbor Square block right here next to us over, over here at the beginning of downtown. And the two other kids from the block is our historian archive, uh, uh, DeSoto Brown from and in the Bishop Museum. Welcome back, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. Aloha. And it's uh, Ed Killingsworth, uh, friend and business partner, Ronald Lindgren, live from his Long Beach, California again. Hi, Ron. Hello. And hello to you, DeSoto. Nice to have you back with us. Good to Thank have you. Good to have you back. So before we dive in, let's uh, uh, let's basically celebrate uh, someone who's always with us, at least spiritually, and she's an expert in what drives us here on the island, which is actually tourism, our economy number one. And we can get the first slide up here. That's our exotic escapism expert, Susanna. And here she is, it's her uh, 42nd birthday. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, she, uh, at the very bottom left, you see her when she came here first, which was half through her life, so 20 years ago. So, uh, Suzanne, uh, uh, happiness and, and health, first and foremost, uh, you're twice the age and just as beautiful inside out. And thanks for the encouragement and inspiration for us. And DeSoto, maybe you want to congratulate her in your language? I do. How old is the now, Suzanne? And I want to know how you say happy birthday in German. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, Liebling. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron, what are you doing there at the bottom? How are you going to congratulate her? Well, I'm happy to pass on some birthday congratulations to uh, Susanna as well. From a picture where I'm actually standing on the same one I as Susanna was to the left. Uh, but 20 years later. So uh, happy birthday, Susanna, from paradise. Yeah, and you're looking at her swooping sexy curves from the sw swooping sexy <laughs> curves of the Lanais, which is the Kahala Hotel, you guys' first project on the island. And there we go. And we actually happened you around uh, your guys' keynote speeches of the uh, National Docomomo Symposium you got us in there, and it actually turned out to be the same suite. How sweet. So, what a reunion. Happy university again. <laughs> and anniversary. So, um, let's go to the next slide here, which is uh, basically uh, recapping uh, the last two shows. We talked about both towers. We did at the bottom right the, our mandatory uh, eco check. And we had to say that uh, while typologically there were, um, you know, the, the project was a pioneer in having caused and created more downtown living in high rise condominiums in the same area, but architecturally, uh, poetically, and pragmatically, performatively on all levels, they weren't able or willing to keep up with the high standard of Harbor Square. But it had inspired other different typologies as this car dealership, which you see at the top right, um, sort of almost diagonally across the street, up to other typologies. Uh, and that gets us to the next slide. That is very personal to you, Ron. Share with us what we see and how that relates. Yeah, these are uh, some pictures uh, taken at my home in Long Beach, uh, which uh, was not designed by an architect. Um, it was designed and built by a contractor, and yet it has uh, so many of those uh, uh, features uh, for uh, using the climate uh, naturally, two-story living rooms, uh, adjustable louver glazing, uh, and uh, doors that go from floor to ceiling, all kinds of wonderful mid-century modern uh, touches that did come out of uh, some concerns about uh, climate and how the, how the home was oriented directly north and south, but not by an architect. And I think that's great, actually. And I think we should look, look back into that. I think that makes for another show with you, Ron, about that. And I how that think so, too. I was just going to say, I think we need to see more of this house. Perfect. And I think I would, this I'd is... I'd be 
Very glad to show it. Indeed. Yeah, I think this is a perfect example how the avant-garde basically informs and, and motivates the, uh, the mainstream. So let's yes. go uh, back to Harbor Square and uh, next slide. We were promising to uh, throw in some more sort of mystery that is sort of uh, gravitating around the project. We were told, and I think it was our uh, walking encyclopedia fellow, Don Hibbert, that originally the architect that was chosen for the site to build high-rise condos was actually Takashi Anbi. And these are two projects from our previous shows to Soto. Uh, left is King Center and to the right King is- Center. Yeah, and, and the other one is on the right is a two-story commercial building in Kaimoki. Uh, which unfortunately, if you go there now, it has been sold, I think, to a Korean client, uh, client and they thought they need to repaint these louvers green, which uh, I think is a little sad because I assume this sort of goldish is, is actually the original. So that being said, Anbi was very, very environmentally, as you call it, Ron, environmentally conscious and 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 was having his architecture dwell heavily upon that. So you, you would wonder how would he have brought that into the typology of a high-rise condominium. And next slide, there is actually a clue because there is a project that he did. This is the Contessa Tower and versus this picture is taken very sort of ideal, idyllically and, and, and idealistically from Alawai where it looks like almost like a tree architecture, uh, you know, um, pretty much almost like a Primitiva, like a grandfather of Primitiva, and that's yeah. how we always thought yeah. about it. But if you actually, you know, follow it where it actually is, is actually close to H1, our main uh, through fare through Honolulu. And with that, it shares something with Harbor Square, which is also on the very heavily frequented uh, Alamana Boulevard, and both obviously compromising your Lanai luxury, you know, uh, because of sound and, and, and basically noise pollution, right? Right, right. But um, let's let's think about this. So um, how would Ed have done that? And, you know, I, I asked you, Ron, that question and your your answer is multitude. It was rather surprising to me. And that gets us to the next slide, which is the beginning of a little mini series here that that is illustrating your answer. So what do we see here? You know, uh, Ed uh, strove to do high rise condominiums around the world. And uh, we'll be looking at a few, and what is especially uh, uh, apparent is that the use of balconies, lanais, whatever they might be called in whichever part of the world they were built, were definitely part of these projects. This uh, is showing some drawings from the Clementi Park Residential Complex in Singapore uh, from 1973 to 1975. Wow. This, in fact, was Ed's first design for an entire urban community. Uh, it consisted of 540 condos, 470 of which were in four 29-story towers on 25 acres of tropical gardens. And that sketch on the left shows that the top of each of those towers had four corner units that were all two stories tall with two stories of glass wow. uh, looking out over Singapore. And the next slide. I, let's just hold on for one second. What a, oh, yes. what a pioneering proposition. Suzanne and I were just last night talking about Singapore, and Jay was sending me a little trailer that Singapore is basically praised for how innovative it is. And there is this architectural firm there called Woha, and they are the most contemporary leaders in what we always uh, propose in, in easy breezy high rise condominiums, natural event line, and they do that, and they're called Woha. And here is Ed having been the pioneer in that, and even more ironically that it didn't, and probably he was ahead of his time, right, and just needed. But now again, his, his inspiration comes to fruition through these colleagues' work. And I also want to point out there's a little uh, show quotation on the top right with Richard Lowe, where he was sharing his work with Victoria Ward, and Steve Au had been the architect and had then actually built as DeSoto and you and I have been talking about, unfortunately, torn down warehouse in Ward Plaza. But he had proposed yeah. these towers that to me are surprisingly similar to that. So it was definitely a zeitgeist phenomenon of the leaders in the avant-garde of that era. So yeah, keep on going. Uh, next slide, Ron. Yes, uh, this is a, a perfect sketch of the Round Hill Plantation Resort 
in Montego Bay, Jamaica from 1970. Yeah. This happened to be Ed's first totally master planned resort. Uh, and it combined 400 condos with 600 hotel rooms. Nine stories tall might not seem like a high rise, but in Jamaica, uh, out in the, <laughs> along the ocean front in the jungle, it certainly is. Yeah. Uh, this was being developed by Ed's most powerful and, and probably favorite real estate developer, William Zeckendorf. Mm. And while this uh, project was being contemplated, Zeckendorf happened to be, at the same time, the owner of New York City's iconic Chrysler building, yeah. the mm. Astor Hotel, and for some reason, he was the owner of Franklin Wright's Roby House in Chicago, mm. which is the ultimate prairie-style home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, uh, the, the picture in the upper right corner shows how there's a consistency in his architecture in terms of the display of exposed structure uh, as ornament on a building. The upper uh, right uh, picture is of the Kahala Beach apartments. Mm -hmm. yes. And again, you told me the story before, then the project fell through because of some political kind of turmoil and because of these Germans, because Zeckendorf is Zeckendorf and that's German, right? <laughs> All right, let's move on. This is embarrassing. Let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> This, uh, this happens to be uh, a rendering that uh, Ed Kelly's would do itself. Uh, it was called the Delray Residential Complex. Here again, uh, uh, this was the first hospitality project mm. in the office, and it placed 400 condo units with 1,000 hotel rooms in this massive high-rise block. Mm. Uh, and you'll notice that all of, the all of the rooms, whether they're hotel rooms or uh, condominium, uh, units have these uh, long horizontal balconies running across you know, their entire width. Yeah, and a picture that I thought I put in, but I hadn't, so I got to make you use your imagination. One of the next shows we're going to do with your friend and uh, colleague Larry Stricker, Ron, and he is just now at the reopening of his Mauna Lani on the big island uh, that we're going to dedicate a show to, and the Manalani reminds me, especially that iconic image from the distance from the ocean where it's at the foothills of the Mauna Kea. Yeah. Um, it, and as you, De Soto said, it's really emphasizing its, or, its horizontality, right? This sort of lanai yes. bands, like ribbon bands. Yes. It's really, yes, and, yes. And the uh, Mauna Kea Hotel, obviously, by SOM further up that coast as well, right? Yes, very much so, too. And that leads us to a project that was proposing the similar and on the next starts on the next slide, Ron, right? Yeah, this was uh, another attempt by Ed to be a speculator. Uh, he joined with a contractor and a realtor to finance and build what uh, one of the earliest proposed condominium developments in the entire Los Angeles uh, basin. And it was to have been located on an oceanfront bluff in a very low rise residential neighborhood. There were uh, 44 mansions in the sky on 11 floors, which meant that all of the condos were corner units with uh, that desirable cross ventilation. Mm. These two bedroom, two bath convertible den units were really spacious, up to 3,200 square feet. Uh, the condos were fully glazed from floor to ceiling beneath what was a six foot deep terrace setback that provided shade to the room. So if we go to the next, uh, slide and, and I have to say shame on me. I wasn't uh, updating Eric our producer on the on the new slide So we're actually looking now at what you perfectly described the collage of the three images the Carlos oh, Denise exterior and the interior and the floor plan We don't have what used to be the first picture which you added so I'm sorry But so we have the next two pictures is actually the model unit From up close and then the one from the distance just to let you know yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the composite uh, picture, uh, you, you'll see at the bottom uh, left, the mansions in the sky as they were advertised in this very early condo project. Mm -hmm. And the next, the next picture shows that those condos were, were completely surrounded by six-foot-deep uh, balcony terraces. And in fact, uh, Ed's nod to promoting California indoor outdoor living is the fact that those condos, uh, those those spaces outdoors 
are actually as large as the living rooms and dining rooms inside combined. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And, and now I have to say this: this is this is not a rendering, as we like to call it these days. It's also not a recent Carlos Denise photorealistic because that is actually <laughs> real. And you know, tell us why. From the previous projects, we haven't seen any uh, Julia Schulman uh, documentary pictures. Yeah, this this is a picture of something that does exist. Uh, but the fact is uh, that this very early condo just didn't fly. And that was because uh, the home buying public uh, couldn't really take to the idea of living under a con you know condominium association rules and paying regular high condo maintenance fees. Mm -hmm. This whole idea was new, foreign, and really off-putting. It's time just at the time. Yeah. So what we're saying is that, that this high-rise condo wasn't built. And in fact, none of the other other uh, four that I was mentioning were also built. Yeah. But as the, as the next slide shows, at least a demonstration uh, unit was built at grade, which turns out to be a rather uh, handsome home. Uh, on the beachfront in Long Beach, California. Exactly. And then, so again, here we go. Um, it, it sort of now is, you know, nothing less, but also nothing more than what that Killingsworth wor body of work started out. Uh, we have the Frank House up there, you know, obviously one of the most popular case study houses. So again, uh, as sad as it is for this project, but also as beautiful, at least to have this sort of exemplary one story sort of model home mock-up but let's go to the next slide this makes obviously harbor square even more special because within the almost or a little more than you correct me 2000 projects total of the killingsworth body of work harbor square is in fact the one and only in the world that has been built and completed right that is correct and, and so that being said you know you just haven't been reflecting that it was sort of an, an exercise in Lanai's and Harbor Square having some that made you think about, Ron, almost a, I call it the manifesto for the must of Lanai's in Hawaii. And please say this in your words. <laughs> yeah, uh, hold tight because I'm about to do a diatribe back on uh, something that's been puzzling me. When I see such a well used Lanai as the town tower uh, Lanai's at Harbor Square, it does remind me of something that's really puzzling. I, I've had the great pleasure as a Haole of a visiting Hawaii dozens of times, once even for a full year of work. Mm -hmm. But though I think I know the islands a bit, not much, but a bit, I simply don't understand why someone residing in the tropics would prefer living in a hermetically sealed high-rise glass box without the knives. Me either. So here's my unsolicited list of why I believe Lanai's in tropical high-rise condo towers are absolutely essential to the creation of a humane architecture. That means an architecture that is lived fully in Hawaii. And the reasons I'm going to list shortly might seem self-evident, but I still think they're worth consideration. Mm -hmm. First and rather obvious, a Lanai large enough to be furnished is surely a valuable amenity in itself as an additional outdoor room. Mm -hmm. Lanai's provide detail and the enlivening, ever-changing play of shadows to tower facades. Okay. And, and the shadows cast by those stacked Lanai's, as shown in this uh, uh, picture, effectively and naturally shade the indoor rooms. Lanai's provide human scale to tower elevations. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly because everyone knows and has experienced and has grabbed onto the three foot six inch height of balcony railings. Mm -hmm. Lanai's that display furniture and potted plants, like we see here, provide a touch of human warmth and visual accessibility to the tower facades. And by this, I mean that uh, distant viewers in a car, for example, can imagine as they're driving that they could enjoy such outdoor garden balconies in the sky. Also, perhaps self-evident, but worth mentioning, the owners of high-rise condos with Lanai's can personally keep their floor to ceiling glazing clean from both sides, mm -hmm. thus always ensuring clear views. Those living in fully glazed hermetic boxes cannot fully enjoy the late sunset shading in the evening 
or frankly, any of uh, any full nighttime views, because the reflections in the glass of their own pale faces <laughs> and of their frigid, fully air-conditioned interiors <laughs> obscure the beautiful experience of twilight. Awesome, awesome. And if, and if we go to the next photograph, I have one last item that many people don't think of at all about the knives. Uh, my, my, my final point is, every year in the United States alone, 600 million birds are killed when they fly into these glassy high-rise buildings. The birds simply can't see these faceless, scaleless, transparent facades. Mm -hmm. But birds can perceive lanai's and balconies, however, as three-dimensional objects, and they do use them as resting places in the sky. So there's my diatribe. And let me just add, too, that this is something that makes uh, my co-host and I say that why isn't it a legal requirement that new condos have to have absolutely on absolutely and again we're we're not just streaming i this bird here i contributed that uh to uh because i'm living <laughs> that in waikiki grand i had that sliding door open and this bird came in and was having a good time on my bed and it found its way out again so it's possible so only here in hawaii uh, 12 month um, summer, uh, you can embrace the uh, fauna and the flora. So let's go back to the to the latter one. Go to the next slide. And 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 so, why does this here happen, Ron? Why does the green grow out of your signature louvers? Yeah, this is an interesting development that really shows the love that the owners uh, have had, many who have lived there ever since the building opened. Frankly. Uh, some of the homeowners, this is showing louvers that are concealing the parking garage from view, but of course letting uh, the air in so there's no need for mechanical ventilation in these parking floors. But some of these owners have put pots of vines uh, right up against uh, the inside of the louvers where the bumpers of their of their parked cars occur. Mm -hmm. And they did that with the idea that they wanted to see these vines head for the sun and suddenly appear growing through the louvers. Yeah, and this is actually reinforcing a, one of our many crazy ideas. Next slide, and I give you a keyword, uh, DeSoto, for, from a previous show we did. We called it the proletarian people power parking plinths. And what was that That's about? right. Well, we, we were conjecturing that if the day comes that there is less or fewer amounts of privately owned cars and there's better transportation that people can make use of that might in turn reduce the number of parking spaces that are needed in condos that are already equipped with them and if that in fact how comes to pass that's where your urban nomads as you say can come to live and they actually will have very comfortable spaces to live with a lot of flow through ventilation and, and using it, what was made for cars. Oh, absolutely. And in a certain way, maybe because this elevation is actually the west, the ocean facing, actually maybe better than the privileged people up there who are still facing some of the, that west sun and the urban nomads down there uh, at the lower part of the food chain and here at the lower part of the building might be actually more privileged. So it's kind of flipping That's things, right. right? That's very interesting. That's right. And keep right. just going more crazy and go to the next slide and push this to the next level of craziness. And and you had, had, had kindly uh, borrowed the term uh, Stackland Eyes and that traces back to uh, basically copyright to our activist journalist, Kurt Sandburn. Hi, Kurt. Hope you're fine. I uh, haven't heard from you in a while, so hopefully you're doing well. And and we were then saying, what if you start to basically populate downtown, which you see at the very bottom left, and you make this into jungleism, where the genetic code is basically borrowed from nature, like a like a bamboo grove, which is just as tight as it can be, uh, so plants shade each other by being loose enough to get enough light and, and, and rain into it to make it thrive. So why can't that be the genetic code for uh, basically urban planning? And that way, Harbor Square would be sort of embedded with these other skinny towers, and it would be sort of a pioneering seat, one could almost say, for, for such a development um, as, as him having been the instigator. And let's go to the uh, next slide here. 
Um, and until then, I, I throw these here in. I took these. Uh, we have to appreciate what it is because until that crazy vision becomes reality, it might take a little while longer. But on the left, you see it in this sort of amazing urban jungle next to the finest pieces of tropical brutalism. Or on the right, uh, which I took this, where you can see these two cars behind each other. And the one in front actually belongs to Pet Moore. And Pet reached out to me through our tropical tutor, Bill, and consulting me what to do when she wants to sell her car. And we're saying, don't sell your car because, again, these cars, these SLs were put on the market same year as the building. They're young timers now. They're relatively affordable, as we pointed out in the last show, both the cars and the units. So hold on to them. They are coming classics and they will only increase in their value. Even if you want to still keep this sort of very American greedy capitalist view on things, right? So these are keepers. Um, we will, uh, next slide and last slide, from here on we will leave Harbor Square to uh, keep on cruising on Sunset Boulevards. <laughs> and uh, where are we cruising? I think we're going to your very long beach, right? And for what reason do we do that? You know, first of all, of course, that forehead you're seeing in the bottom right is where the diatribes are formed inside that skull. <laughs> but, uh, we're heading back to, to my hometown to consider uh, some university campus master planning. Uh, my city happens to be blessed with what I think is the most handsome, architecturally unified, and the most beautifully landscaped campus in all of the state of California. And the, the, this happened because Ed Chillingsworth broke all records by uh, serving uh, as campus master planner at this particular university for nearly 40 years. Absolutely. And doesn't this remind us of our view of UH DeSoto? I don't know that, that no, let's not get into that. <laughs> well, we might have some suggestions to, again, from learning from best practices for our whatever Boy, you want I'll to call say. practice. I'll so, say. Uh, with that, uh, thank you guys so much for having had a good time together again. So uh, see yes. you next week. Actually, for that, we're going to start. We're going to make this a multitude, um, probably, uh, you know, three shows or so. So yeah. until then, um, um, see you. And uh, until then, please uh, stay as uh, tropically, exotically metropolitan as Ed so perfectly did here. Bye bye. <laughs>